Again, hello everyone. I'm so grateful you are all here uh, with us on our mastermind. I'm still getting this Zoom thing down after only four years of using it. So, um, I'm grateful every single one of you uh, joined us today covering uh, uh, some of the things about the NAR settlement, as well as ways that you should be positioning yourself and your business to be able to handle it right now. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to my co-host, uh, Mr. Sean Rawls. Uh, you got a couple of things you're going to share with us, General. Uh, take it away. Thanks, man. Uh, thanks. I don't think I've ever seen you make a Zoom error before. That's uh, that's that's impressive. That's impressive. I'm going to hold speaking to forever. There is a first for everything. All right. Who's that handsome guy that you got there? Is that Lance? No, that is. Um... <laughs> no, that's not Lance. Good Lord. That's Man. not Lance. You're Fort Lauderdale. Man. Man. Yeah, of course. Man. How are you, man? Dan Watson. I know. Not Lance. Yeah. Now that you're closer, I can see the difference. You look like you look like Lance for a second. That's so funny. He wears shirts kind of like what Lance does. So. Well, there you go. Fair you. enough. Fair enough. How is everybody? <clears throat> Everybody Good. Muted. All right. Hey, Sean. How are you? Good. I for some reason I'm not showing up on here. I am live, but it's got Fantastic. a blank screen. Fantastic. All right. Well, we'll 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 we'll, we'll live without looking at you. <laughs> um. So listen, I wanted to I wanted to kind of have a conversation around all things NAR settlement. Um because I think it's important and I think it ties into one of the things I talked about the first mastermind we did this year, I gave you guys a list of like the, the, the things that were important for your business from my perspective. And one of those things was early adopters versus late adopters. Do you guys remember that? And just talking yes. about how, when a lot of times when change comes up, our, our first reaction is to resist it and push back on it and discount it and uh, say it's not going to do anything and it's not going to happen and it's not going to affect me and whatever. And then you know, fast forward a year or two later, and 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 you were you were in the wrong camp. And in my experience, anytime big changes are presented in our business, um, they always get followed through on. So the spirit of, of this conversation today, I want to kind of have an underlying theme of embrace these changes like they were your idea. Just embrace them like they were your idea. <clears throat> and if that sounds hard for you or that sounds foreign to you, um, just try to push yourself to, to to fake it until you make it and 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 just it, it, pretend like it was your idea to begin with and look for all the ways that this could be an advantage for you because it's going to take you looking for the advantages to capitalize on them. Um, some parts of the country are doing this differently than others. Some parts of the country do real estate different than others. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine in Alabama the other day, and um, Alabama, I think, is the only state left in the United States that's con that's completely buyer beware. They don't have inspections on homes. They they don't have seller's disclosure statements, and the buyer is completely up on their own. And 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 they will not. They they've they've pushed back on changing that for years and years and years. But it's. But they're they do different business differently in Alabama. You guys have done differently uh, from a paperwork standpoint than we've done in Atlanta for a long time. A lot of these changes are things that we've been doing for a while from a paperwork standpoint. It's just the deluge of the media in what they're trying to do to the the buyers and sellers out there that is um, that's becoming more topical and, and making sure that we're prepared to handle that. So today is really about preparing. Uh, and getting your mind right and making sure that th you, we put some tools in your pocket um, in terms of what your experiences are. And I'm going to say a couple of things. Scott's, uh, I've, I've asked Scott and Lee and Mark Gracie, our team leaders uh, and leaders in our group, 
to, to kind of help facilitate this on some things because uh, particularly um, Scott and Lee have been involved with some of the um, Glover University stuff and, and they he's been doing a superior job of getting things out in front of people early and um, coming up with solutions as well. But I'm gonna share my screen for a second because I want you to I want you to understand something. You can share. I can. Yeah. One or two pieces. Um, all right, everybody see this? Yes. Okay. Um, I came across this a couple of weeks ago and I thought it was a fantastic example of what's happening in our business right now. Um, if you look at this graph, on the right-hand side, you have uh, on the vertical axis is confidence, and on the horizontal axis is uh, competence. And what's happening now is everything on the left side of this graph. I'm talking to people with, I've got a lot of real estate ores in the water with people with all different companies um, from Compass to Sotheby's uh, to, <clears throat> to um, some boutique dependent luxury things. And what I'm shocked by is leadership in most companies uh, has been pretty quiet about what's happening with NAR and, and, and even to the point where people are saying, it's not going, we charge 3%, that's what we do, we're not negotiating. And so you just need to tell your clients that and it's, we're not gonna be impacted by this. Well, I need you to know that everybody's gonna be impacted by this, everybody. Um, and, and by impacted, I, I do understand that there are some impacts that are going to be going to be positive and there are impacts that are going to be negative. On the positive side, if you are a listing agent, you have you have less concern than if you are a buyer's agent predominantly. Um, the, I think where we're going to see some commission compression is going to be on the buyer side more than we see on the seller side. There's a, there's a phrase that we've heard forever called, you got a list to last in this business. And I think that's going to prove very, very true in the coming months and years as a result of some of the changes that are going on with this NAR settlement. But I want this graph to represent, I want to make sure that if you have this sense of confidence about how this is going to go, you are having confidence in the absence of competence. <laughs> And the more time goes on, the more competence we're going to gain. And as we gain right now, and, and, and if you recall kind of Keller Williams, if, if we're on the left side of this graph, this is kind of the, um, this is the, we don't even know what we don't know part of the learning process. It's that unconscious incompetence is kind of where we are on the left side of this. And we're, and as we move to the right, we're going to start getting into the conscious incompetence, which says, okay, now we're starting to understand what's happening and how this is going to affect my business. And I'm starting to really see where my, where my holes are. And I'm starting to see where my weaknesses are, my blind spots are. And then you kind of end up in that bottom part of the U where it says the average person lives somewhere with a lowered sense of confidence because of what they do and what they know and what they don't know. But we've got to keep trudging along that path on the right to the right hand side of this graph, because the more we know, the more confidence we are going to have. And my belief is real estate age, uh, companies can come out all day long from a leadership perspective and say, this is how this is going to work. This is how we're going to play it as a company. This is how this is what you need to know. And this is what we expect you to do. But I want to be perfectly clear. There's not a there, there are very few brokers in America who are going and sitting at the kitchen table and signing up listings and sitting at the conference room table and signing up buyers. So this this war on commissions is going to be won at the kitchen table. It's not going to be won at a team meeting or a sales meeting where somebody gets rah-rah or gets um, 
beat over the head and, and, and become delusional over what's not going to happen in this business when it's going to happen. So you guys are on the front lines. And every time you sit down in a chair and you talk to a prospective seller and a buyer, your ability to have absolute competence, the most amount of competence is going to determine the, 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 the year you have from an income standpoint. I've always said that your income in our business is, is directly tied to what comes out of your mouth. And if you know what to say and you have confidence when you're answering questions and handling objections and you've got a you've got a you've got a listing presentation and a buyer presentation that that head on addresses the issues that this NAR settlement has created for our industry, you're going to be OK, but you're going to need to make sure that you are doing everything you, you can to move to the right on this graph so that your confidence comes from your competence. Does that make sense? Okay. I just, I, when I saw this graph, I freaking fell in love with it. And I just thought it, 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 it explains so much in such a simple way. And it really exemplifies where we are and where we need to go more importantly around this issue. All right. And, you know, Sean, to that point, there's so many people out there right now who are um, experts who are claiming that they know exactly what's going to happen, exactly how this is all going to play out. And if you go and look at the transaction history of so many of those people, uh, they've either done one, two, maybe three deals or have been so detached from the daily that you really question their relevance. Well, and here's what's here's there's a couple of ways you can play that, right? It's um, there's a, there's a great there's a great saying that says you know everyone a blind squirrel will always find a nut somewhere, right? So if you're a blind squirrel in this business and you do one or two transactions a year just because you don't really work at it and you're one of the people that are that that, that are less skilled in our business. My guess is I don't really care what happens in our industry or what goes on. You're going to do one or two deals a year, no matter whether the economy is good or the economy is bad or the rules are tight or the rules are loose or things are favorable or things are unfavorable. Idiots will always find a transaction or two. Yeah. This call is for people who want to make a living in a career and who, 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 who make solid six and seven figure incomes to maintain that because what's at stake for people that have great incomes in this business is a loss of income because of a because of a struggling skill set. So, yes, you're exactly right. Now, the other thing I've always said in this business, if you if you've been around me at all, one of my things that I've always and I used to use this on listing presentations 25 years ago, and I would say, look, here's here's the deal. We're a really weird industry because we pay idiots and experts the exact same thing. The problem is, Mr. Seller, you don't know whether you're working with an idiot or an expert until it's too damn late. <laughs> yeah. Right? So yeah. what's interesting about the NAR thing for me is I think that statement for the first time ever is going to be outdated. Because all of a sudden, I think idiots and experts are going to get paid differently. And they're no longer going to be paid the same. I think I think everybody's going to fight for and have to demonstrate the value they bring to a client to secure their compensation based on their model. Now, one of the things we're finding is the, the, the in the early stages of this is people are getting hit with the hey, I understand I don't have to I don't have to pay a commission to the buyer's broker or hey, I don't have to pay uh, your or I have to pay your commission out of my pocket or they, they, they know enough to be dangerous, but not nearly enough to be competent in, in what's going on. And I think what the public needs to understand is, number one, we've always our commissions have always been negotiable, right? Um, but I think they're confusing negotiation with choice. And I think this is, an op this is an opportunity for us to talk about choice versus negotiation, because 
Um, I see Jen Doak. Um, I see Beverly Shanahan. So let's say let's say Jen or Beverly, y'all are just on my screen for a second. But if let's just say that, and I say, okay, well, I I charge this to help you buy a home, and I charge this to help you sell a home. This is my fee, and this is the fee that I charge. And I'm going to tell you all the reasons why I charge the fee that I charge. And some of that has to do with the fact that I've been in the business for 25 years and done X number of transactions and saved my clients X millions of dollars over that time, right? That doesn't mean you can't go hire somebody that'll sell your house for a dollar. If you're, if you're, if you're at, don't confuse choice with negotiation. I have a fee structure and my guess is let, what, if you're driving a car, let's say you're driving a, a, a Mercedes what you're saying is, hey, I want to drive a Mercedes at a Ford price. And the fact of the matter is, you can't do that. You can go buy a Ford for a Ford price, but you can't go buy a Mercedes for a Ford price. And in the real estate, in the real estate world, particularly with the NAR settlement, what they've done is they've made us make sure that you're really clear on the choice that you make as a consumer, that you have a choice of paying for a Ford or a Mercedes or a used car out of some offbeat lot somewhere just outside of town, you can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't mean you can negotiate the price of a car to the price of any other car. Does that make sense? So I think choice is a conversation that I would definitely want to have with anybody that I was sitting down with to make sure they understood that, look, hey, you always had a choice. You still have a choice. And you can hire somebody. Now, that doesn't mean that in the thick of negotiation, if we can't come to it, I have the ability and I have the desire to be somebody who can make this happen for you. If I have to kick in a little bit to make it happen, listen, it's negotiable. Everything's negotiable and I want my clients to win and I will always be a team player, right? But by, by nature, I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to work for less money just because there are some news articles out there that are making people think that that's what's supposed to happen. Um, is anybody dealing with that in a way that's interesting right now? Has anybody had the had, had the objections? Because I think one of the most powerful things that we can do on these calls is make sure that if somebody, if you screwed something up or you weren't prepared or you were prepared and you hit a ball out of the park with an objection that you handled, I think we need to know about it because the more we can we can spread the word on what works and what doesn't and what people are getting hit with, the the better we're going to fight this battle and protect our entire industry uh, over the next six months to a year. Has anybody had an experience where you've sat at the table and 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 you've had to um, to clip those wires? Sean, I haven't ha had it, uh, an objection at a table yet, but um, I've had friends, um, you know, in my circle who have asked me, how is this going to change things? And quite frankly, I said, it's really not. And they're like, oh, okay. I mean, it's, I think we are making it a big deal more so than the public will, especially if they trust you as their real estate consultant, then you don't, nothing's going to change. And I already know that. Yeah. I, well, I hope you're right, I, but 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 I'm going to challenge you and tell you I think that I think there's I think you're going to be have some pressure on change, and the 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 thing I think is important. If I go back to like teaching new agents in this business, it was always fascinating to me because when we would teach new agents, I would say, "Well, what are you what are you what are you most worried that a seller is going to ask you?" What are, you, what's my, what are you most concerned that somebody is going to ask you that you don't like to talk about or you're uncomfortable talking about or you don't feel like you've got a good answer for? And, and people would always have an answer for that. And they would always walk around with this idea that, man, I hope they don't ask me blank. Man, I hope they don't ask me blank. Man, I hope they don't ask me blank. And I would just say, wouldn't it just be easier to have a great answer for that instead of worrying about whether or not they're going to ask you that? Um, and I think this topic is a topic where when it comes up, because it's going to come up for everybody, 
when it comes up, I think just psychologically, somebody can tell immediately if they've asked a question that causes discomfort or anxiety on any level. Would you agree with that? Yes. I, I think they know. It's like, you know, if you're a parent and you ask your kids something like, you know, like I've got high schoolers. So we're like, hey, was anybody drinking at the party tonight? You know, all of a sudden, like their demeanor changes, right? It's like, uh, no, no, uh, no, 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 no. You know, one no would have been fine. You know, you didn't need to give me 10. Um, but you can tell when you ask a question in somebody and it causes a little bit of panic or a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of discomfort, if not a lot, when you ask it. When it comes to this topic, if I can stress anything to the people on this call, it is I want you to be so comfortable when this comes up that you can throw out your entire presentation because you'd be comfortable just sitting down in an easy chair with an adult beverage and a cigar and just talking about this as long as they want to talk about it because you are completely comfortable with your understanding of it, your ability to navigate it, how it impacts you, how it impacts your, your people, what it does or doesn't do to your economic model, what opportunities it gives them as your clients, what opportunities it gives them as a client of yours or somebody else's, the mistakes and pitfalls that people are making based on their incorrect assumptions of the data and the information and the headlines that they've been given. I want you all just to go, I'm glad you asked. I love talking about this. Tell me what, tell me what you, what do you understand about this? Because this, this is going to start falling into the category of everybody's going to feel like they should talk about it, but very few people are going to be really entrenched in it. They just, they, they feel like they, they've heard enough of it that they feel like they should ask and your ability to answer it is going to determine whether it scratches that itch for them and puts it to bed or it, it picks a sore and it continues to bleed. Make sense? Okay. Um, do you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take this. Can I take this off now? Everybody got yeah. it? Sorry. I didn't mean to have you keep looking at a graph. Um, in, in retail, one of the things about retail, would you agree that if you say anything and your phone hears you, how many people start getting ads for whatever it was you said in a conversation over dinner with somebody a, a night ago? Like, I'm still, I, I, it still blows me away that my phone is that attached to everything that comes out of me. But what's happening in that moment, if you think about it, is companies are driving their brand to you and, and, and selling the benefits of their brand to you before you're even a consumer for them. Like if you mention shoes, you're going to get inundated with shoe choices and ads. And you don't, you may not have even been looking for a shoe, but my God, but you've gotten enough ads to know that, you know what, if I actually want to buy a pair of cowboy boots, I actually liked the ones I saw the other day from this company. I'm, I would go buy those. Yeah. And you start connecting dots that they want you to connect, but they're selling their brand to you before you're even a consumer for them. I think that in, in when we look back on the time that we're living through for the next for the rest of this year, let's say, I think when we look back in the rearview mirror, people are going to realize how important selling your brand before somebody else is a consumer for you was important. And I think your messages need to sharpen up. I think your messages need to multiply. And I think your messages need to be completely value oriented so that they, they, they start planting seeds of understanding what you do from a real estate professional sense. Well, and Sean, to your to your point, um, in going and looking at that, 
it's with with all that stuff that starts popping up on your phone for those ads and everything like that it may not be that you've ever searched for shoes but you may have searched for something or said something that put the um uh, process on a path to say I think Sean may be interested in some new shoes because he researched his feet hurting the other day or uh, or, or or something along those lines that caused them to realize you're going to be a consumer. And for us, if we go back to the very first mastermind that we all did together with you, where you talked about the bubble chart, um, yeah. that's one of the ways that we have to look at this. So if we look at a real estate transaction here, we need to start looking at all of the different places that can cause a consumer to even start getting on the path to buying a home or selling a home or investing in real estate. And we have to insert ourselves much earlier in the process so that we make sure that when that actually does happen, we've been the person that's been popping up on their radar over and over and over and over again. And while things like the 36 Touch have been designed to help us be there um, consistently, there's other things in terms of AI that are going to help us to be there more intentionally when it matters the most. Agreed with that. Now, if you look at social media, for example, Scott, if you if you look at it and go, all of us make posts, right? And we all kind of, when we make posts, I can tell whether I struck a nerve or I hit a happy button or I did something on a, on a post that I've done based on the number of likes or whatever. And those are good. But what, if I were to change it and say, instead of getting likes, I want to start creating content that gets that that instead of two or five or seven shares of my content, I want I, I'm not concerned about likes as much. I want to drive as many shares of my content as I possibly can. Instead of looking at the easy, like, oh, I like that. That's cute. Oh, I like that. And I got responses and all that stuff, which is great. But if I were looking at this as a multiplier or an ability to get my brand out to people that I don't even know who are being shared material with people in other people's database because they said, hey, this guy said something really cool on social media and I'm sending it to my people because I think they need to hear it. All of a sudden, my brand exposure just multiplied because of shares. And I think that from a social media standpoint, we've all got to figure out how to get our, our inf present our information in a way that gets, yes, a lot of likes and a lot of attention, but also create shares, also ends up in the hands of, of other people's spheres of influences so that you start creating this ripple effect of your brand that starts reaching people before you even know they need to be reached and reaching people you didn't even know you were reaching on a local sense. And, I, and social media is just one aspect of it, right? Um, everything you do can be your brand. When you hold an open house now, you better make sure that it's just not about the house. Everything you do is about your brand. Every well, and open houses have just become even more valuable to you as the listing agent. Yes, they have. They're 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 back to being super cool again, which I'm super excited about because they were one of the huge rocks of my business when I was selling uh, years ago. It was my favorite thing to do. I practiced all week for that. I got ready for. I spent six days of the week getting ready to have a massive open house. And I just I, I I created a lot of clients out of that, and I think that um, I think they're a huge opportunity for people. So, so why do you believe why do you believe that it's more it's going to be more valuable for a listing agent now to hold their own open house? Well, a I, I'm a I, I'm old school in that I think that open houses are about finding more sellers, not just more buyers, because people yep. are kicking that around and, and and they don't always know who they're working with. So, um, I, I I think the people. It always drove me crazy when people come in and say, well, it wasn't a very good open house. I only had three neighbors come by. And I'm like, no, three neighbors. Those are three potential sellers. What are you talking about? That's fantastic. Um, but I think that, again, I think that buyers, there's so many aspects to this NAR from a buyer standpoint and a seller's and, and, and a seller standpoint that you've got the ability now, whether you're talking to a seller or a buyer, You've got to do some real educating. 
you've got to do some real reframing of people's understanding. You've got to do some real interviewing with what people's concerns are and what their needs are and what they want. Because buyers, for example, they look at it and go, you know, well, I can save the commission, right? And you go, yeah, you can always save the commission. But the question is, can you get the house? And they look at you because sometimes what I do isn't about saving you any money at all. Sometimes it's about winning a multiple offer situation so that your offer of 120% of list price actually gets you the house that you're dying to have. And the only way that's going to happen is by me having a great reputation in my industry and knowing so many awesome agents that know and believe that if I bring them a contract, it's going to frigging close because that's the reputation I've got. And I think people forget that there's a lot that we do. And one of the things that I've loved most about the real estate industry that I think we don't talk about enough, I think our greatest, one of our greatest values is that we create an arm's length transaction. And I think that is the, the danger of what's happening right now is that buyers are going to feel like they can go directly to a um, directly to a seller and save say and not pay the commission if they're they're forced to pay a commission that somebody isn't paying and we all know that's disaster waiting to happen because if 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 you has anybody ever worked with an asshole before anybody anybody ever anybody ever nobody dory if you're working with them right now you don't have to raise your hand right so if if you look at this and you go if it weren't for you that asshole might have never come to an agreement on a contract because had they been negotiating for themselves, they would have blown up in the middle of the thing because they didn't have the diplomacy or anybody shielding the rest of the world from what a jerk they are. And by the same token, we've worked with people who are complete pushovers who would have gotten completely taken advantage of, and they needed us to make sure that they we protected their interests and kept them from being harmed in a transaction and actually get them a better deal than they would have ever gotten for themselves. That's what I think. And I think we have so much opportunity right now to really talk about what it is we do in specific detail. I don't think anybody cares how many houses you sold unless you can create a story around that. I don't think really people really care about uh, about the money you make. I don't, I don't think, I mean, all, all, there's a lot of things that we've touted in this business for a long time that just kind of looks like blah, blah, blah to the consumer right now. And, and what's going to get their attention is tell me a story, demonstrate your brand. Tell me why you are, tell me how you saved the day in your last transaction. Tell me about your client in the fact that his wife died, that they that they've been married for 52 years, and 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 his partner 52 years passed away, and he couldn't bear to to stay in his house anymore, and his children wanted him back home, and uh, and they trusted you with that transaction. It was maybe the most important real estate transaction in all the transactions this guy who was 90 years old has ever had in his lifetime. And he trusted that with you and here's what you did and you took care of and you coordinated and you got the things organized and you got the house packed up so that he didn't have to and you made this happen. Tell me a story that demonstrates you are a brand I can identify with. You are a brand I want to work with. You are a shoe I want to wear. And I will pay more money for something I truly want and connect with emotionally, physically, spiritually, behaviorally, whatever the connection is, you've got to do that as a brand. And it's it's not about I'm number one in my office, I'm number three in my office, I'm on the ALC. Nobody cares. What they care is do something that connects what you did to what I need. And paint that picture for me so that I don't have to paint it for myself. And I think your brand is really important. And by the way, because idiots and experts are not going to be paid the same anymore, potentially, those of you that are running teams that have a great team culture, that have a great team system, 
you're going to have the ability. I think one of the big opportunities is going to be with teams that have a great brand, that have great contacts and consistency, that generate great leads. You're going to be able to create more people on your team that are newer and less experienced. And you're going to take away some of the, the individual idiots in our business and move them to your team so that they're getting the training, they're getting the backing, and they have the backing of your success to hide their lack of experience. And I think that I think that this is an opportunity for people who want to grow to grow. And I think this is an opportunity for people who have grown and who are big to get even bigger and get even better. But you've got to be crystal clear about what your value is, what your brand looks like, and how you demonstrate that to buyers and sellers on a daily basis. And more importantly, how your team reflects that for you when they go out and do what they do. And Sean, you know, one of those other things kind of piggybacking on that is I think right now, when we're, while we're talking about your brand, it's time to update your buyer and seller presentation materials, not just the contracts. The contracts are going to be taken care of. That's going to be a thing. This Your state and local agencies are going to take care of some of that. Uh, here in our offices, we've taken care of some of it for you. And make sure you're updating the presentations where you're having these conversations with people to insert some of the answers to the questions that they might have. I think, I think you've got a choice to make in your presentations. And I think your choice is, I'm going to ignore the NAR until it comes up in my presentation, and then I'll address it if and when it comes up. Or you're going to say, I'm coming straight at them with, with, with everything I've got on NAR, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to give them a chance to ask a question I'm going to bring it right out up front and I'm going to take, I'm going to play offense from the get go on this. And if I were choosing, I would choose the, the, the latter. Um, I, I would, I would choose the offensive approach to bringing that up in my presentations from an, and I would make it very educational um, so that they, I, do you have any questions? Now you may tell me what, you know, tell me what you understand, tell me what you've seen or heard because I'm finding that people are having a lot of misinformation out there and the misinformation is way outstripping the, the actual information that, that, that should be given. So I wanna talk about this and I wanna make sure that you understand completely uh, what's happened out there and how it impacts you. Calls. Who's that? That was Richard, I muted him. Oh, God. Um, so that's that's, I think that's a big choice you've got in your presentations and, and how you do it. I, I You're going to get it and you're probably going to get it more. It's good. You're going to get a build of it more. And then it's going to, I think we're going to be on a bell curve of information with, I think, I don't know what the period of time is, but we're going to be going more and we're going to deal with this more and more and more and more and more until we get to the point where it's kind of old news and everybody's kind of, it's kind of normal and everybody knows the drill. But until we figure out what normal is, I think I think we owe it to to the people that we speak with to just make this a part of our conversation. Now, when I say that, I will tell you this. I think um, in, in for the team leaders, Mark and, and, and Lee and Scott, um, I think um, one of the things that I think is in our industry, we don't really practice. Um, we're, we're, we're like a professional football team that plays our games on Sundays, but we don't practice, uh, on Monday through Saturday. Uh, we just practice and we practice at the kitchen table. And, um, I don't think, I think this is a really important topic from an industry standpoint, and I don't think you should practice at the kitchen table. So no. the way you can have this conversation more and more and more is one, I think we can do a, I think we can do a better job in our market centers of having this conversation a lot more in our market centers, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in a classroom setting or a team meeting. But I think there needs to be a little bit of time devoted to talking about scripts and how this goes and and and, and throwing out one objection at the beginning of a class and have everybody pair up and, and say how they'd answer it and see who, who did a really good job with it and share it and who didn't do a good job with it and share why it wasn't a good job. Um, but the other way that you can practice this is 
call your database. If we're gonna if we're gonna get our brand out there and talk about the value of who we are and what we are, we might as well start talking to the people that are in our database and just call with the script of, hey, you probably heard about seen your I'm sure your phone's getting lit up like mine is with all these crazy headlines about the NAR settlement. And I'd like to talk about it for a second or buy you a cup of coffee and we can sit down. And I'll tell you what my thoughts are about what's happening in our industry and what the what what I'm concerned about and what I'm optimistic about and the things that I think are going to be great for consumers like you. Yeah. You know, that was another thing that some of the top agents who were at a the event that I was at recently um, said. They said, now is the right time to communicate to your database to let them know you have always had their back and you will always offer the best service at competitive prices. I agree with that. I agree with Talk that. About if you're doing it without them being a, a, a live buyer or seller, it's it's just you're practicing so that when you sit, then the more... The more you have this conversation, the easier this conversation is going to be for you to have and the better you're going to do at it. Um, so I would try to have it as much and as often as you can have it because you're going to fall into a natural rhythm and a, and a natural comfort of just kind of talking about it, um, which I think is I, I think I think that sense of confidence, if we went back to that, if we went back to that graph that I showed at the beginning, if you have a sense of confidence that has no competence behind it, I think I think that reeks for anybody who's smart. Um, but we all know when we're around people who are who are extremely confident because they're competent, it's very reassuring, and it and it really makes us feel comfortable about the direction these people take because you feel like it's a smart person that knows what they're doing. And I think that that we have to make sure that that's what we're conveying to people when we're having conversations around this. So here's one of the other things that was brought up in this, and I, I want your thoughts live on it because I haven't shared this with you. One of the things that Jeff said in this was start training your agents, and, and he was talking about everyone who owned a brokerage in there on the buy and sell uh, on the buy and sell side. That as a buyer, they will be expected to pay the difference. Um, and as a seller, they will ex be expected to offer concessions. But what he was really getting at there is when you have them sign a buyer broker agreement, let's say that you sign it for 3% and you're able to get two and a half percent for the seller. He was talking about making sure that they understand that they're expected to come up with that half a percent to make you. Well, I think expectations are, are really important. And, 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 and here's, here's what I think everybody needs to really understand um, all the NAR has done, if you think about a game that anybody likes to play, well, let's just, let's call it Monopoly, right? Since it's real estate. Monopoly, when, when you, when you get Monopoly and you, and you look at the, 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 the directions for the game, they have rules for the game, right? It says, here's how you play. Here's what's allowed. Here's what's not allowed and go play the game, Right. But what's not included in there are strategies for winning. Like they tell you what the they tell you what the guardrails are. They tell you what the boundaries are. They tell you where you can't go beyond. But everything within that, you get to develop a strategy to figure out how to use the rules based on a strategy to win a game. And I think what we're doing now is we're the rules have have shifted. They haven't changed completely, but they've shifted. And those rules shifting mean that we have to look at it and we have to look at our strategies and go, okay, based on the rules that we've got now, the new version of the game that's come out, um, we, have to, we have to play it a couple of times and we have to figure out the strategies that are going to work best for us. And I do think setting expectations, Scott, is going to be important for that. Um, I think it's going to be really important for that. I think what people, one of the things that, that that I saw, I don't know whether it was through the Glover thing or something, but it's, hey, listen, what you're paying is really not changing. Um, it's it's really more about how you're paying it, yeah. right? It's not it's not what you're you're going to pay the commission. You're just going to pay it differently. You're going to pay it out of a different pocket on paper. And it's going to change a little bit the way you might go about uh, some of the things that we typically go about in real estate. 
but it's always going to be attached and it's going to be factored in. So you could say as a seller, I don't want to pay a buyer's agent uh, a, 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 a commission. And you go, okay, um, you have the right to do that. So one of the things that I think is going to be really important because now we're not going to have commission in the MLS, right? So we're not going to know, we, as a, everybody's thinking of it as a buyer, one of the frustration things that I've got right now is I've got to pick up the phone now every time I want to show property and go find out what the hell is being paid on, on, on this property. And if I'm showing 20 properties, I got to make 20 phone calls or I got to go to uh, the, the, the Kai's website and then I got to go to the Remax website and then I got to go to Keller Williams website and then I got to figure out what the commissions are being offered on the properties that I want to show. Well, here's a newsflash. You're going to have to do the same thing when you list a property. Because when you're sitting there talking to a seller and you're coming up with a plan that's going to get their house sold fastest and for the most amount of money, you need to know what everybody's paying a buyer broker in the house, in the competitive houses that are going to, that, that would be shown in addition to their house. So if you pull it up and you say, okay, well, you don't have to pay a buyer broker, but let's look at what's happening in the marketplace. If I was working with a buyer right now that I was going to show your property to based on the sales price we're talking about in the area that we're in, I've got 20 houses that I could show that would roughly be competitive in the price and house scale as yours. And of those 20 properties, it looks like as of last night, when I pulled all the data and made all the phone calls and looked on the websites and took all the time that I have to do now that I used to not have to do, it looks like about 16 of the homes are paying a fee to the buyer broker of anywhere but two and a half to 4%. And four of the properties are telling the buyers to pound sand. The average number of houses that I show when I work with a buyer is about six. And for somebody who's doing a, a, a lot, they're probably looking at 12. And if I'm a buyer broker and I have to make all the calls to figure out all the properties that I could show a buyer, and I see that, that 16 of them are gonna pay me a 3% commission or better, and four of them are not, do you think I'm gonna show the four that aren't first or absolutely dead ass last. That's an IQ test, right? <laughs> it's an obvious answer. And if and, and 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 it's this is a tricky, this is a tricky conversation from everything I'm hearing, but I don't understand what's tricky about it. This is human nature. And this is sales and people are either going to get paid or have to get paid from their buyer, which everybody's sensitive to. So why wouldn't I go and show the properties that are going to pay me a commission so my buyer doesn't have to come out of pocket and not buy a furniture set so they can pay my commission? Well, and Sean, it's not just that. It's also you're it's not saying that you're not going to let your buyer know that those properties exist. You're absolutely going to do that. And by process of elimination, your buyers will say, hey, you know, thank you for letting me know about those houses. I'm not interested in them because they're not willing to work with you and pay you. Um, and so it's you're not going to show them them. It's that your buyers are most likely going to say that's off the table for me. Um, I want you to be compensated and I want them to pay for it. So here's what's going to happen. I, I, I think I think we don't know what's going to happen is what's going to happen. Right. I think right now we're talking about stuff that we just don't know. And, and the reason we're talking about it the way we're, and, and why I felt like it was so important for this call is I just think we have to examine all the options. And I think we have to be open to any direction this thing goes, because what's going to happen over the next six months is we're going to find a new norm in our business. We're going to find a new rhythm of doing things. We're going to have our, our buyer presentations are going to change a little bit. Our value proposition to a buyer is going to change a little bit. The way we choose properties to show buyers are going to change a little bit. They're going to be involved in that selection, just like Scott says, where you go, here are the 20 properties we can show. 
I just need you to know, based on our buyer agreement of the commission that I'm going to, or the fee that I'm charging to work with you as a buyer's agent broker, these four properties are not paying a commission to the buyer broker. So whatever we work out, if we can't get my commission covered in a contract, you would have to pay my fee out of, outside of the contract. That's different. Now, yeah. how that's going to shake out, I don't really know yet, but I think we've got to make sure that we're prepared for all of this. And one of the things on a listing side or on a buyer side is you've got to understand you should have and be prepared with a menu of services that you would that you are comfortable with. Because I was having a conversation with a with a luxury agent in Atlanta last week um, after this mastermind I had on this topic, by the way, um, she called me after the mastermind and we were chatting and she said, do you think, don't you think though, that, um, that for the luxury buyers, that that's that, that commission change, even if it comes through, don't you think that's not going to be that big of a deal for the luxury buyers, that it's really going to be more of an issue for the lower end buyers? And I was like, Perhaps, perhaps, but it also, I could also see that the people that, that, that are, that, that are your high end clients, they're usually high end clients because they're successful in business, right? Very rarely do you have a luxury buyer or seller who's not a successful person in the world of business. So I think I could also see a very savvy and smart business person calling Chrissy and saying, Hey, Chrissy, um, I was at dinner with some friends the other night in our neighborhood and they're going to be put, they're going to be selling their house in a couple of months. And their house is the house my wife wished we'd have bought when we moved in and it wasn't available. It's her favorite house. And so we've kind of talked to them about it and we want to buy their house for $3 million. And you go, that's awesome. And he says, but here's the catch. Um, since we've kind of, found the house and we've kind of talked about buying it and this is a friendly transaction. I do want to have representation. I'm just not sure that that's worth $90,000. And I'm wondering if you would do it for 40 or 50. And if you're not prepared to have that conversation with a menu of services or whatever your standard breakdowns of, I will do this for this. I'll just write a contract for that, or I'll do whatever. Cause you're going to have people say, well, I'll just hire an attorney to represent me and I'll pay an attorney, you know, $2,000 to handle my paperwork and protect me and that sort of thing. And you go, Hey, good luck with that. Because nothing's, nothing's more intimidating to a listing agent than saying, Hey, here's, here's a, here's an offer from a buyer who's being represented by their attorney. Because if I've got three other offers on the table that aren't attorneys, I'm probably going to do everything I can to not go the attorney route. And that's just stuff that it makes sense on the front end. Because I've seen those articles that buyers are just going to get attorneys to write their stuff, and I'm going, try presenting an attorney with a buy or offer with a with a with a buyer as their attorney, and see how 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 comfortable that is for most listing agents. In and by the way, in every single state, you could hire an attorney anytime you wanted to, all the way up to this point. All the, all the way. You could have them all the time. All the time. You know, Sean, here's one thing that I think would be crazy not to think of. Um, buyers want representation, but they want the house more. Yes. And if yeah. we're not thinking about that, we're really not doing a good service to ourselves. Yeah, it's um, we have a we have a kid in our house right now who's um, who's going to be turning sixteen in October, and um, if it were up to him, he we, we would have a car in the driveway like right now, just waiting on him to 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 be able to drive it. Um, and and we, you know we've looked at a couple of things and gone with it. And, I'm, and, and this is a kid that like, I mean, he would absolutely go out and buy something that would explode in three days because he just, he wants it so badly. Um, and I think that, I, but, but I think there's, we, we've all seen that. And I think you're right. People want the house more than it. rock, paper, scissors. The house is the most important thing. And I think that we get off on these bunny trails of, 
representation and costs and fees and this and that. Ultimately, it's about you getting the house you want. And we can say that, and it sounds kind of basic and simple, but I can assure you, once the money's changed hands and you have the keys and you're in the house and the pipes burst or they don't burst, or the train comes through and wakes you up at two o'clock in the morning, or there's no train that wakes you up at two o'clock in the morning because you have all those little things. Once, you, once you're in, you're in. And you realize, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. Oh my God, this is a nightmare. Oh my God, I made a mistake. Oh my God, I feel so comfortable that we covered every base. I'm so glad we negotiated that last bit of money because of so-and-so. That makes me feel so much better. It's the house matters more than anything. And I think that that, that people kind of act like the, they get all caught up on all the minutia of stuff that really is insignificant to what's really most important. And that is you're here to find a house and make the right choice of a house. And you have a lot of choices that you can, and, and, and there's going to be the best choice for you. There's going to be some other choices for you. And there's going to be some bad choices for you. And you are equally likely to select any of them without the proper guidance, right? That's why Carfax has become so important in the car world. It's like, I can actually tell if somebody actually, if this there was ever a, a, a bumper replaced on this car. But without that, I wouldn't know. And I think we have to be a little bit like a Carfax for people to say, here's my, here's my issue with this. Here's what you're not seeing that's gonna be a problem for you in this house. I've been doing this for 30 years in this neighborhood. This side of the street is a problem. That side of the street is perfectly fine. I know it's weird and it seems odd, but if you look at the topography and you look at this, that side of the street is a flood issue. This side of the street is not. And we've got to run the insurance claims to make sure that there's nothing on the clue report that shows that we've got an issue. Buyers don't even know what a clue report is. There's a ton of value, but again, there's a story behind every closing you have that you're not telling. Even if that story doesn't work, I've had, we've been working on scripts lately with people that I'm working with, and it's, um, I've had three agents that have solidified clients in the last 60 days. There are people that said they don't want representation and they don't want to work with them only to come and sign up and work with them because they just had no idea of the value they were trying to throw away because they didn't understand what value truly was. And everybody's reading headlines and nobody's reading an article. Correct. I guarantee you. Correct. Um, and for those of you who didn't see, I put the uh, scripts uh, that I really want you to print out, practice, study, uh, sleep with, uh, wake up with every single morning in the chat because like Sean said, if we don't dig in on this, if we don't practice before we get to the table, um, we're changing the industry for the worse for the next decade. I truly believe we have three months to change the trajectory and the uh, what our industry looks like for the next decade. And that doesn't happen um, in, in, a, in, a, in a classroom. Uh, that happens uh, one kitchen table at a time. And you need to be prepared before you get to the kitchen table by practicing with your peers, and by practicing on your own, what you're going to say when you hear objections, when things come up. Um, because on the listing side of things, the listing agents are still very much going to drive what buyer compensation will ultimately be. Um, and so when you're going on your listing presentations, make sure that you're not only sharing the value that you have, but sharing the value of what somebody representing the other party on the other side of the transaction is actually going to bring to them as well. Um, because if we don't do those things, our industry is going to look really different in a not so good way if we're not practicing before we get there. In, in 1993, the real estate laws changed. Was, this wasn't just a state thing. Beretta is not a straight state thing, is it? A, a buyer's no, that's a, 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 no, national. It's national, right? But a brokerage relationships and real estate transactions act. It's called Beretta. 
And in 1993, if you go back to your real estate school, um, they, they, they talked about in 1993, they realized prior to 1993, buyers were not represented in real estate transactions. It was like, like Alabama, what I said earlier in, in the call, but buyers weren't represented. And they felt like buyers were getting the raw end of the deal. And they were, they were spending a lot of money trusting people that they were working with only to find out that the person that was showing them houses weeks at a time didn't represent them and was working for the, for the benefit of the seller. And prior to 1993, um, I got licensed in 1988 and I really didn't start doing anything until 1990, 91. But in that time before Beretta hit, um, sellers would offer all kinds of crazy things to buyers. I had somebody in my office was given, uh, the, the, the seller gave the Mercedes that was in their garage to the buyer's agent who sold their house in addition to the commission that they did. Okay. Now, I say that because with them taking away this, 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 whatever, now we can, now we can call a standard commission 3% based on all the news headlines, apparently, right? Um, but the, 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 the 3% that everybody expects to get in, a, in a, on, on a local level, let's say, if that's going to go away and now they're going to say, we're not, you don't have to pay a commission. There is no standard. There is no norm. There is no nothing. There's only what you decide to do at the kitchen table. I think most people are going to be trying to protect that two and a half to three percent um, compensation to a buyer broker at the listing table. But I want you to also realize that. Let's go back to the the strat the the, the conversation around rules versus strategies. If I'm a listing agent. And I now know that 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 commissions paid to a buyer broker are very negotiable and very not normal or standardized in any way, shape, or form. And I also know that I'm that there's a lot of bad, bad, bad real estate agents that actually have real clients. Anybody ever seen that before? Terrible real estate agent actually really good clients. Anybody ever seen that? Yeah. Right. So I'm going to talk to you as a seller and go, look, when do you want to be out of here? So if you want to be out of here, let's do this. Let's price your house at $900,000. I'm going to charge you 3%. When it comes to what, what, what you're willing to pay the buyer broker, I'm going to suggest we pay them 5%. Because I'm pretty sure that if we pay 5% to the buyer's broker, we're going to get a contract quickly. Because there's a lot of people in my industry who are money driven. I'm not one of those people. I'm not going to sell my soul for, for, for a dollar. But I got news for you. I'm surrounded by people who do. And for 5%, I'll get you a buyer. And what's really cool about that 5% is if there's anything wrong with the inspection within reason, they will make sure it is taken care of. It's not going to be an issue because they'll chip in whatever they've got because they're making so much more money. They can't sell, they can't get out of this house and sell another house and make as much money as they're going to make on your house. They'll, they'll, they'll figure out how to make the inspection issues go away for their buyer. That's a strategy. That's a strategy. So when we think about it, I want you to understand we can our our commissions are negotiable. In fact, I think they're more negotiable up than they've ever been. Because now we have capitalism in full effect. And we can say, hey, we're willing to pay more. We're willing to pay more. Come sell our houses, we pay more. There was a company in Atlanta years ago. Does everybody know who Johnny Isaacson is? He's a senator for the for 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 Georgia. Um, he he passed away a number of years ago, but he was prior to becoming a senator, he ran a successful real estate company. It was called Northside Realty, and he had a program that he did with Northside Realty, where and this is back in the '80s and early '90s before he went into politics. Um, they had their signs, it's Northside Realty, and, and, and certain signs had a star on top of them that said, uh, this is a $10,000 property. 
And the $10,000 property is every, for I think it was like every 10 houses they sold or something that they, they, they did. And they did kind of a lottery of the 10 houses of the real estate agents that were the buyer's agents for those 10 properties that sold. And they gave a $10,000 bonus that was lotteried after so many homes sold in this program. So sellers contributed like $1,000 towards this thing so that their house could be promoted as a 10,000 K property. And then once 10 or whatever the number of properties sold, they, they did a raffle. One agent, one of the 10 buyers agents got a $10,000 check for, for, for selling a house that was a 10 K property. That's, that's neat. Kind of interesting, right? I mean, it's, a, it's, Again, I think the cool thing about this is we get to think about new strategies. And I think most people's mindsets are going to be going to the threatening part of, of new strategies and how that's going to hurt or take away. And I think we need to be prepared in our comfortable conversations with people around this is the good news is you can pay more than ever to get the best results ever. I can sell your house in three days. I can get you this. I can get you out of here. There's just, now we can just we can we can create a, a a compensation program for the buyer side and pay for what make your house a no brainer for somebody to want to buy and blow the competition away. Because if they're looking at twenty properties and you've got twenty average thinking to scarcity minded people and you've got one seller who's kind of an abundant thinker that thinks. Holy crap, this you're right. And they want to play that game, they're gonna win. They're gonna win. And all of a sudden you're going, you know what? I'm actually okay overpricing your house by fifty thousand dollars. Why don't we pay ten thousand dollars bonus to the buyer's agent that sells your overpriced POS? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like what car dealerships do. Uh if, if you're familiar with the car industry, like they'll normally choose like the unit that they've had the longest and they'll put a spiff on it and say, uh, all right, anybody who sells this one uh, is going to get a $2,000 bonus on top of the commission they would have made. Exactly. Target's shown the most, Sean. Well, I just, I think, I think, look, I, I'm not, we're not here to roll out anything of what we're doing, but what I do want, I want to get off this call and have everybody's mind thinking optimistically and opportunistically about what changes we're facing. I had a conversation. I don't think I told you this, Scott. I had a conversation with Steve Murray um, last week, and we had a great conversation. I hadn't talked to him in a while. Tell everyone who um, Steve Murray is. What's that? Tell everyone who Steve Murray is. Tell everyone who Steve Murray is before you go into the conversation. Steve Murray is... I call Steve Murray the most trusted man in real estate. Um, he's got a backstage pass to every major real estate organization, franchise, and independent in the country. He is the guru of understanding what real estate companies worth is, what their values are. If anybody sells a real estate franchise or real estate business, um, he's usually the company that evaluates the, 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 the real street value of that business. Um, most companies hire him to consult with them. He doesn't give anybody secrets away of what they're doing, which is why I call him the most trusted man in real estate. But what he will say is, you guys are tired. You're old. You need to, you need to get some new leadership in here. You need to get whatever, because some of the companies that are coming out, they're really not any better, but people just think they look better because they look more like them and you're 20 years too old, right? Or this is your, 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 you need to get, you need to do a little bit more on social media. You're missing the boat with some of the technology or whatever the issue is that a company has, it has that he sees, he talks about freely with them from a consultative standpoint. But he is, if you, every once in a while, you'll get inundated on social media with, uh, the people, it's almost like a top agent, but it's really top brokers where they say, you know, I'm a top 100 broker, top 50 broker, top 30 broker in the United States. Um, those are all from real trends. And Steve Murray's company is real trends. And most people have heard that name out there, but he's, um, 
he is an absolute hoss in our business. But anyway, so that's who Steve Murray is. So the conversation, I, I just, I call, asked him for a little bit of his time just to kind of talk through some stuff and just from an industry standpoint. And I wanted to get his take on this NAR thing. And he said, you know what's funny? He said, I've got, he does an event every year called the Gathering of Eagles. And his Gathering of Eagles was yesterday in Arizona. And he said here, he said, I don't know, for the last five or 10 years, he said, the Gathering of Eagles is a 300 to 358 uh, broker event where we get down and we sit down and we do presentations and talk about things and share about what we see about going on in the real estate world. And, but it's like clockwork. It's 300, 350 people. Just we can spitball it and I'm going to be pretty much right. He said, Sean, I have 760 brokers signed up for next week. Wow. He said, everybody is freaking out about the NAR changes and they want to know what I have to say. And he said, you know what I'm going to tell them? I'm going to tell them I have no freaking clue. He said, I'm going to tell them, I don't know. He said, you guys are going to have to go out there and do your job. And you're going to have to educate your agents and you're going to have to get, and then your agents are going to have to come back and tell you what's going on. And then I can tell you what's going to happen. He's like, but I don't, anybody that tells you they know what's going to happen from this, he says they're lying through their teeth. And that's about the time I found that graph that I showed you that uh, with the confidence and confidence. And it's so true. But he's, he's the most knowledgeable guy about our industry. And he says, listen, he said, in 2008, when, when, when that hit, he said 25% of the brokerages went out, went, went out of business. He said, my best guess is I think we will lose 30% of real estate companies in the United States over this. He said, because I think, he said, there's, and there's two reasons. He said, I think there's going, he said, the people that are thinking that they're not going to have commission compression are kidding themselves. He said, because here's what I know. He said, and he said, he said this as long as I have known him, he said, I remember him coming in to talk to us leaders at, um, when I was running the region for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. He came in to talk to all the leaders, the regional owners and leaders for Keller Williams. And, 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 and he said, you know, we, there was a comment about Sotheby's and he said, you know, Sotheby's acts like they have, they have so much more class and they have so much more successful agents than Keller Williams does. He said, but let me tell you, he said, anytime you get in a gunfight with, with, with a Sotheby's broker, I want you to tell them that you'll put your bottom 30% up against their bottom 30% any day of the week. <laughs> he said, because the bottom half of every real estate company in America looks like shit. And he said, because of that, you have a lot of uneducated, unmotivated people, blind squirrels, from earlier in the call, that are just happy finding a nut every now and then. And those squirrels are going to collectively, because for example, I haven't done this exercise on these market centers, but when in, in, in the Rawls group of my six market centers, I would always run, I was curious, because they we had we broke agents down from cappers to half cappers to quarter cappers and then other. And the category of other, which is a quarter cap or less, collectively, when we added up all the transactions that were done by the other agents, the blind squirrels in our group, they generated enough revenue that was equivalent to one month of, of, of commission income for our offices. So they were responsible basically for a 12th of our income. I haven't done that on these market centers, but my guess is it's probably the same. And my guess that you've got, so if you took the bottom half of a roster of any real estate company that is going to decide their fate at the kitchen table and either cave or hold strong, you've got the bottom half of your roster that's going to cave. And they're in, and that caving is going to result in less revenue for real estate companies. And he yeah. says, 
depending on the strength of those rosters, he said, I think we're going to see 30% attrition rate from, from, from these changes because I don't, he said, I'm watching brokers act like nothing's happening and it's not going to infect them. And he said, they're going to be in for a rude awakening. And he said, and then you've got people like you who's going out there trying to get people, you know, prepared for a tornado that may never come. But your people, I bet, based on my knowledge of you, are going to be more prepared than most any other agents in any other brokerage in America. And I was like, well, that's my goal. And he said, well, you're doing a good job. Yeah. He said, but that's my, he said, I really think the bar is low that you're competing against, unfortunately. And he said, and the really unfortunate part is that the, the, the caving that's going to happen in other companies and other brokerages, it does impact you and your agent. And that's and he said, I think that's what people are missing. This is this is an industry issue. It's not a brokerage issue. It's not a competitive issue against any other brokerage brand. This is about our agents getting prepared to fight this fight and hold the line on the incomes that they make. And if they treat it with a, with enough importance, he said, I actually think this could be good for our industry. I actually think that there's going to be a, a significant portion of producers in this industry, regardless of brand, that if taken seriously enough, their businesses will probably improve because of this. Whereas most people they're talking to are going to see that it's going to hit their bottom line and they're not going to have their average commission rates going to be damaged by the time they get through the end of a year. He said, so keep doing it. He said, keep getting people prepared. Keep getting ready. He said, you cannot over-prepare for this fight. He said, if I was sitting in front of your people right now, he said, if I could tell them anything, I would tell them you, they cannot over-prepare for this fight, but they can absolutely under-prepare. Yeah. And that's why that's why this topic, it, it just, I was really happy to hear him say that because it's, I've just been really whooped up about it since that hit on that Friday. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and you're right. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are um, ignoring it, thinking nothing's going to change, putting their head in the sand and waiting for it to just pass. And uh, if there's one thing I know, it will pass and it's going to look different on the other side, no matter how you slice it or dice it, it's going to be different. Exactly what that difference completely looks like yet we can't paint the picture for you and just know it will be different. It may change drastically. It may not. And just know it's going to change. And the more you hone your skills, the more you prepare yourself, the more you practice your scripts or conversations or dialogues or talk tracks, whatever the heck you're calling them now to be compliant, the better off you are going to be. I, I hope that- One I, conversation at a time. Yeah, I, I hope that that our team meetings down there are um, super attended because I think every team meeting we have needs to have a, a, a portion, if not all of it, if need be, devoted to what you guys are seeing and experiencing at the kitchen table from the from the previous week. Because if you start having those conversations every week at a team meeting, just the number of experiences you're going to hear about are going to start increasing. And you're going to be able to tell just from, because you've gone to every team meeting for the last three months, you're going to be able to go, wow, I can sense this is building or I can sense this is hit or whatever. Or I, but if you just go to one, you have no reference, you have no context for it. I used to, um, back in, Back before the internet, when I was selling real estate and we had the MLS on on, a, on the computer, um, we, I would every morning I would print out the new listings and I would write down in the MLS number of one of the listings, and every, and I had a notebook and every day next to a Nate I had I had an MLS number written down, and I could look back years, and and so when I would find a property and they would go. How long has this been on the market? Because they never showed how long a listing was on the market. I could go, I could look at that FMLS number. I'd trace it all the way back. And I go, it was listed either Tuesday or Wednesday of February 2nd or 3rd, because that's, that's where the number changed. 
And I think that, and that helped me a lot, by the way, as silly as that sounds, it helped me a lot with validity and conversations with people. But I think my, the idea is the context of, you have to do something consistently over time so that you can have a real sense of context of what's going on in our industry. So um, have great meetings down there and make sure that you guys are keeping, I don't care if you have to abandon a, a topic to talk about this because there's so many people that had experiences or, or things that they did and they, how did, how could I have done it better? Or here's what I did and it worked really great. Or here's something I saw. I mean, anything that we can bring to the table as a group that helps us formulate better strategies to win the game. There's nothing more important right now. Nothing. It's timely. It's got, we have a window. We have a, we have a, a runway of, of, of still close to 90 days. And we've got to make sure that we're paying attention and we're, we're, our eyes are wide open looking for every opportunity we can to find a way to create more value and to, and to sell more houses and to gain the confidence of more buyers and sellers than we've ever done before. Because for the first time in a long time, idiots and experts are not going to get paid the same. And that's good news for everybody on this call, by the way. There's, a, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's something I read that I've never heard before. And I want to read it to you because I think it's the coolest thing ever. And it's the, it's the mindset I want us all to have. And I want you to write this word down. The word is anti-fragile. A-N-T-I, fragile. Anti-fragile. And here's what I read. Some things benefit from shocks. They thrive and grow when exposed to volatility, randomness, disorder, and stressors. Anti-fragility is beyond resilience or robustness. The resilient resists shocks and stays the same. The anti-fragile get better. I love that. I want us all to be anti-fragile, anti not resilient, anti-fragile. We're not going to stay the same and resist this shock. We are going to get better because of it. Yeah. But it's going to take practice. It's going to take a lot of communication. It's going to take you getting super comfortable when somebody wants to talk about this, to talk about it as long as they want to talk about it. Because by the time you're done with them, they're going to be like, oh, okay, where do I sign? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, any other closing thoughts, Sean? Oh man, no! I'd love to hear if anybody has any ahas or thoughts from from the last hour and a half. I hope it's been as helpful as I wanted it to be. Uh, I'll say something. Van, <laughs> Van. Uh, we we had an ALC meeting about the buyers agreement, which some of us in the room were a little resistant to, um, but eventually we're we. I mean, we we all need to start doing it. And one thing that Heather Edwards brought up that I thought that really stuck with me was, so she said to Richard, so I just need to get them to sign this document so I can put this paragraph saying that the seller will pay my concession or whatever we're calling it in the, in the offer. And when it's proposed that way, it's a little bit easier when you're talking to a buyer, it's just, I need you to sign this so that we can get the seller to pay my commission. And it makes it a lot easier, I think. It does. But um, I will tell you one of the, th we have unbelievable attorneys here in Georgia. There's a guy named Seth Wiseman, who I think he's probably the best real estate attorney for documents in the country. I put him up against anybody. And the one thing that he has warned everybody in Atlanta is do not ask that your commission get paid in a contract. It has to, you can ask it, but it has to be the buyer asking it. From a yeah. professional standpoint, the broker, they've said, we're not paying the broker. So you have an agreement with the MLS. If you're gonna show property that says they're not paying you commission, that's an offer by the listing broker and your acceptance of the offer to show their property, by the way. 
the way these contracts work. He said, however, the buyer is not, they don't have an agreement because they're not a member of MLS. So the buyer, your contract has to say the buyer requests that the buyer brokerage fee of 3% be paid by the seller at the time of closing. <laughs> but you can't ask for your commission in a contract. It's a violation of ethics. And he said, it's a can of worms. Just, just make the buyer ask for it clearly in writing and you're good. Sean, the way that paragraph um, should be addressed, and you're absolutely correct, the contract is not to be used to negotiate your commission. The paragraph that we have that goes in there simply says, uh, without having it in front of me, buyer and seller agree that seller shall pay commission of X percent to buyer's broker. I think that's totally fine. You're still doing the same thing. Yep. Exactly. Yep. It's the buyer and seller that are agreeing to those funds, not broker to broker. And so listen, just from a, just a thought hits me, you're, for those of you that have listings, you're going to get offers. If you've got a, if you've got a listing where, where for whatever reason you say you're not paying a buyer broker, which there's, there's a, there are situations where I could see that being the case. When you get one of the idiot agents that send you an offer that says, you've got to pay my bro my fee, help them and show them what professionalism looks like and say, hey, before I submit this, why don't you change that to say that your buyers are requesting? Because you're just so you know, if you did this with some agents that I know, they'd have you hung for this. Let me do you a favor and help you out with your verbiage so that you don't make this mistake with the wrong agent. And, I'll get, and I guarantee you, in the spirit of Keller Williams and helping people and being good, good agents out there, that will go a long way. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to help you keep your license. You might want to consider changing this part. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Any yeah. other thoughts? What do you guys think about this stuff or anything that I've said today? <clears throat> I think we're, we're getting a lot of thumbs up. I saw uh, angels. That was enthusiastic, Angel. I like it. Well, listen, I, I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate your attention. I know it's valuable. And my goal when we have these meetings is to make sure that it's an investment of your time and not a waste of it. Um, you guys do a great thing every day and you work your asses off and you don't have any time to be spinning your wheels with something that's, that's a waste of time. So, um, I, I, I believe this is super important and I hope that um, I hope I've kind of conveyed that in a way that you think it's super important and, and, and you can get to practicing so that you can make more money than you've ever made based on the new rules of the game that we've been given. So let's come up with the strategies that let everybody win and um, and let's go make it happen. And download those freaking scripts in the chat right now. If you haven't gotten them, get them. Print them out, use them, practice them over and over and over. I appreciate every single one of you for joining us today. Go and make it happen for your business. And if you practice all of these things and you never have to use them, that would be the greatest thing that could happen. And guess what? You're probably going to have to use a lot of the stuff that Sean and I have talked about today. I appreciate you all. Have an amazing day and we will see you soon. Thanks, everybody.